Welcome back to the second in this lesson of under, We Can Understand the Bible. I hope you've enjoyed what we've done so far and let's hope we can continue and help each other understand the overall principles involved. So the question is, how are we to correctly interpret Scripture? Can we correctly interpret Scripture? When I'm studying with anyone, usually I, very early in the study I will help them to understand there are three important words that we need to uh, underst understand as we approach scripture. Uh, the first is context, uh, the second is context, and the third is context. Every word has a context of a sentence and within a paragraph. Every paragraph has a context within a chapter Every chapter has a context within its book, and each book has a context within the overall scriptures of the of the Hebrew, both Old and New Testament. God has revealed as well in the scriptures with the obvious intention of being understood. So when we read the Bible, we need to know if we're reading historical narrative, poetry, psalms, prophecy, doctrine, or an account of the life of Jesus. Furthermore, we need to appreciate the distinctive style of each writer and the cultural background against which he wrote. Some guiding principles. There are tools we can use to ensure that we strive to arrive at a correct interpretation of the scriptures. For example, if you are interpreting the, the epistles, or the what we call the letters, the following must be kept in mind. To whom was the letter written? What was the purpose of the letter? How would the recipient of the letter have understood its contents? What is the obvious meaning of the text? What is the context of the text? Is the text written with a particular historical setting or culture in mind? Is the interpretation in harmony with the rest of the scriptures? A text always means what the author intended it to mean. It doesn't necessarily always mean what we think we understand it means. Let's look at a few examples that show the importance of applying these tools. Both James and Paul find a common ally in Abraham to support what they are teaching. Paul sees in Abraham the perfect example of a man justified by faith apart from works, according to Romans chapter 4 verse 1 to 3. James, on the other hand, sees in Abraham the perfect example of a man justified by faith that does not work, or at least not works of law. Both men can legitimately call upon Abraham for the support they need in what they are teaching. Paul is arguing against legalism that was creeping into the church, a legalism that taught that one could not be saved unless one performed certain works of law. In, all, in order to be works really of merit as well. This teaching, though well-intentioned, was an attack upon the gospel that claims the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is the basis of our salvation. People are saying, if I can live well, if I can do the right thing, I, I don't need Jesus. I don't need the death, burial, and resurrection as the basis of my salvation. James, on the other hand, teaches that a living faith can be seen because it is an active faith. The faith of Abraham responded in obedience to the command of God to offer up his son Isaac to leave the land. Also, James sees in this instant a living faith responding to the commands of God. While Paul is teaching the works, meritorious deeds done in an attempt to in some way earn God's favour have no part in our salvation, Paul and James are not in conflict. As Luther thought they were, and once you understand the context of the teaching, then it helps us to understand there's no conflict between them. The Hebrew writer helps in understanding Romans chapter 4 because the Hebrew writer says that uh, Abraham was counted as righteous by, through his obedience. Uh, Paul writing in Romans also begins in Romans 1 verse 4 and 5. He talks about the obedience of faith. When you go to the end of the book in chapter 16, verse 26, he says, again, the obedience of faith, or faithful obedience. So the book ends 
of the book of Romans is steeped in the idea that faith is something that is active. It is not passive. It is not there by itself. Faith is something it is demonstrated. And so when you come to Romans chapter 4, when he's talking about Abraham, he's talking about the same thing. God asked Abraham to leave his land, his, his own land with his father, where his father lived, uh, amongst all the idolatry. Uh, and Abraham responded by doing what God asked him to do. He left the land with his family. Uh, and so there was a, a, an action as well as an understanding. And that's often the thing is misunderstood. And that's what gave Luther such a, a, a hard time. Another example is found in Romans chapter 6. This chapter states, In baptism, the penitent sinner is identified by faith with the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus and becomes a new creation in Christ. But really that's not Paul's primary purpose in this chapter to teach about baptism. His main purpose is to answer the foolish question, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He does this by showing how unacceptable it is for one who has been baptized to continue living in sin. It's a rise to walk a new life, a life of holiness, a life acceptable to God, a life that is challenged to be the best that it can be before God, not to wallow in what we used to do in times past. It's not impossible, but it's totally incompatible with the profession of faith made in baptism. We can't be buried with Christ in baptism and fail to change our actions and our attitudes uh, and our thought patterns. The emphasis on the chapter is holy living, not on the need to be baptized, though one's need to be baptized is included. We can only see this emphasis when we ask the text the right questions and use the text as intended by the writer. Philippians 2, 1 to 11 provides another example. With utmost clarity, Paul shows that Jesus is indeed God. But that's not his main point. Paul is concerned with showing Jesus is God, who became a servant, so that believers will see him as a model to imitate. We will miss the instruction to live as servants if we miss the main purpose for which the text was written. How often have we heard these words used to provide assurance when only a few turn up for the prayer meeting? But where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. That the Lord is always with us is a testimony of his word in other places. But the words of our Lord are stating in the context of church discipline being taken by the leaders of the church towards an unrepentant sinner. Jesus is looking ahead into the new covenant relationship with God uh, and he's saying when we when uh, the apostles or anybody really um, states what Christ intended to state uh, and binds and looses uh, on people of the future the way of life or whatever uh, Jesus is with the, with those people there with that decision uh, it's being undertaken he is there when people are being disciplined and that's the context of the passage. And the decisions they have to take, the Lord is with them. We will gain a further, fuller understanding of God and his will for our lives, and in some cases, avoid outright heresy and church division. If our interpretation of scripture is the result of asking the text the right questions and attempting to understand the context of each passage. When we ask the right questions of the text, we ought to end up with the right answers. Studying a small section of scripture, this might be a chapter, although chapter division is not always good, dividing points and understanding the meaning, it could be a prayer, it could be a parable, it could be a miracle or a statement. Certain rules apply in this type of study. Always see the passage in the light of what comes before and what follows. See it in its setting or context. For example, Luke chapter uh, 10 verse 29 is important in understanding the parable of the Good Samaritan. Read the passage and try to understand as a whole. To crystallize a passage in a sentence helps clear thinking. A simple ex example would be Hebrews 1. This passage demonstrates from the Jews' own scriptures the superiority of Christ to angels and shows him to be the divine Son of God. 
You may not yet understand all the details of the passage, but you can grasp the overall thrust. After getting the feel of the passage, it's good to make an, an analysis of its contents. For example, 1 Corinthians 13 could be entitled, The More Excellent Way. We know its subject is love and partial gifts. <clears throat> now we need to break it down. The all-importance of love. The definition of love. The permanence of love in contrast with temporary gifts. The temporary state of the revealed word and the mature state when the rest of the word is revealed. Consider other scriptures that shed light on the one you are considering. For example, Ephesians 4. The use of reference Bible of concordance is important here. Look up words and phrases that you do not fully understand or that you can feel you need to get a deeper understanding of. For example, James in 5 verse 78 says, uses the word patient. The word patient needs to be understood. A dictionary or commentary would tell you that it is more than just to passively sit down and bear something. It is to actively move forward towards a goal in the face of difficulty. We often think of patience as just wait. Just wait. But in actual fact, it, it implies <coughs> patience in reaching your goal. The exhortation then is not to sit and wait for the Lord, but to press on, to keep going in spite of every unfavorable situation until the Lord comes. Helpful ways to study the Bible, ask the question, what does it say? What does it mean? How can I apply it to my life? The study of a person in the Bible, there are over 3,000 different people mentioned in the scriptures, so we have plenty of choice. It's possible to select a specific group of people to study. Anonymous characters, Jesus' friends, kings, rich men, servants, people who become Christians, etc., etc. A character study can be very rewarding for we can learn from people that have travelled the longer path before us, both from their success and from their failure. A simple concordance study can prove very rewarding within minutes. One can have all the places that a person is mentioned in scripture and a character study is born. Books are also available with specific character studies. Most common are All the Men of the Bible or The Woman of the Bible, both written by Herbert Lockyer. Other books deal with few, a few characters in detail. Some, just one character. F. E. Myers' Elijah is a good study. Bible dictionary will also have all the characters of the Bible listed and information on their lives. It's helpful in studying a character to try to divide his life up in some way, even if it's only into childhood and manhood, etc. For example, Jonah. Jonah often has been described as First of all, running away from God, then running back to God, and then running with God, and then running ahead of God. John the Baptizer. We talk about his family background, his preparation, his manner of life, his mission or work, his message, his character, and ultimately his death. In studying a character, it's good to try to get some idea of the time and situation in which you live. For example, to understand Jeremiah's situation helps greatly in appreciating his character. <clears throat> Writing a biography of the pastor's life is a good way to become acquainted with him or her. One writer suggests the following. Fifteen points in doing a character study. First of all, collect all the material which the Bible contains concerning one character about to be studied. Note different characters of the same name. Carefully study the ancestry of each character, especially the characteristic of his parents if they are known. Attempt to em estimate the advantages in training which the subject of your study had during the early days of his or her youth. Carefully attempt to determine the work which your character accomplished. What was the great crisis in this person's life? How did he meet that crisis? What traits of character does this person display throughout his life? Do we see changes? What friendship did the man have? Were they noble or ignoble? Did they help him or hinder him in his life work? Determine as far as possible the influence of this particular character had upon others, upon the nation, 
upon the history of religion. What growth does the character of this passage show? Carefully examine the religious experience of the character you're studying. His prayer life, his faith in God, his service of God, his knowledge of the scriptures, courage in testimony, his attitude in worship. What faults and shortcomings are revealed? What do you find to be the character and influence of this person's children? What do you think was a great sin in any one character's life, if there is one? What was the nature of the sin? What steps led to the sin? What effect did this sin have upon this person's future? In what way do you think the character you're studying is a type or anti-type of Christ, Christ, if one at all? What is the one great lesson in this person's life that you have understood, that you can apply to yourself? Or we can have a word study. Word meanings are vitally important. The meanings are often obscured in translation, and it's only as we dig beneath the surface that we grasp the deeper meaning. There are a number of good word studies that, that show uh, how rewarding such a study can be. William Barclay's New Testament Words is a study of about 60 important New Testament words. W. E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of the New Testament is a more general work listing most of the important New Testament words. Words like grace, faith, justification are rich in meaning and need to be understood fully if we have to read the Bible intelligently. Even the tenses of words can be very important in a proper understanding of the scripture. See 1 John 3 verse 9. The present infinitive is used, which means it does not continue in sin or sin habitually. <clears throat> Use of several different methods of study should be used in order to get a balanced diet. If we only studied characters, we would be weak on doctrine. If we only studied doctrines, we would become depressed, seeing only the ideal and not the real. Remember, as the following example the statements indicate, the richest rewards are to the diligent student. Richard C. Trent says, Holy Scriptures is not the book for the slothful. It is a field rather upon which, the surface of which, if sometimes we gather manna easily and without labour, given as it were freely to our hands, <clears throat> yet of which also many portions are to be cultivated with pains and toil, ere they will yield food for the use of man. This bread of life also is to be eaten in the wholesome sweat, sweat of our brows. After 50 years of Bible study, G. Campbell Morgan said, The Bible yields its treasures to honest toil more readily than does any other serious literature. The Bible never yields to indolence or laziness. Useful exercises do a character study on one of the following people. John the Baptizer, Joseph, Samuel, Timothy, Lydia, Martha and Mary. Can we understand the Bible? Some people say no. Some people say without supernatural help the common man cannot understand the Bible. They point to many divisions in Protestantism to prove their point. Those who say no quote Second Peter 1 verse 20. But know this first of all that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. They interpret this verse to mean that no individual can interpret the scriptures by itself. He must depend on the church to tell him what the scriptures mean. What does the Bible say about the Bible being understandable? Timothy understood. Second Timothy 3.15 says, And that from the childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith is in Christ Jesus. Timothy understood from childhood and that was the Old Testament. The art of Bible study is to some extent one which man has to learn for himself. But there's a good deal which may be passed on from one learner to another. Whole books were to be read to congregations. First Thessalonians says, I charge you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the holy brethren. Paul said, when they read, they should would understand. By which, when you read, you understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. 
lots of books were addressed to husbands, wives, slaves, children. Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Those addressed were expected to understand what the will of the Lord was for them. Ephesians 5, 17, therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That is the way we need to understand it. It offers truth in every spiritual subject. If there is a problem, it is our misunderstanding. That is why Paul could expect Christians to be in harmony when they speak or think or discern. First Corinthians 1 verse 10 says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. The New Testament consistently speaks of the faith. Acts 6 verse 7 says, A great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Ephesians 4 5 says, The Lord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 4 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see as to whether you are in the faith faith. That's Timothy 6.10. Some have strayed from the faith. Jude 1 verse 3 says we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Therefore we should try to understand the Bible like. Partly so that John 17 is true. The world may believe. When people see our disunity, our disharmony, they, they almost despair of trying to understand what Christians are all about. The, this faith talked about is there is a body of truth that can be understood. It can be applied in our lives. It can change and transform our lives by seeing the Christ clearer, by understanding what Christ wants for our life, and then making that changes that makes a difference in our life and our thinking. We should be able to understand the Bible like, but often we do not. Why is that? Sometimes our understanding is affected by our heart, a desire or a desire to justify a particular doctrine that we hold, a conclusion perhaps that we want to keep, a, a prejudice from past experience or teachings, an attitude even of not willing to accept we must be honest seekers. Second Thessalonians 2 says, Receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. We want to look for truth, find truth, and apply truth. Sometimes our understanding is affected by our head. We must be willing to take time to study. The Bible is the most important book we will ever study because of its eternal consequences. We should apply our best abilities in a most diligent way to understand its truths. We should desire to grow in our ability to study and understand the scriptures. We need to look at a few fundamental principles on how to study the Bible and we need to apply them to resolve any alleged contradictions. Read it. That may sound a bit absurd to suggest that the first method of Bible study is to read the Bible, but it's much needed advice. Often we read about the Bible rather than read the Bible itself. The unfamiliarity of the average Christian with most parts of the Bible is one reason why many never really grow in Christ. Listen below are six questions of Jesus from one gospel alone. Have you not read? Have you not read? Have you not read in the law? Have you not read what David did? Have you not read? Have you not read in the scriptures? These questions were asked of religious leaders of the Jews, and they implied that the chief weakness from which the nation was suffering was ignorance of the real meaning of the scriptures that they so highly cherished. These people knew the book. These people read the book regularly. 
and yet, for whatever reason, they failed to understand what they were reading. Matthew 22, verse 39, Jesus said to them, You keep going astray <coughs> because <coughs> you are men who do not know the Scriptures or the power of God. Throughout history, revival and reformation have come, only come, when people have turned back to reading the Scriptures. Of what importance are the scriptures in light of 2 Timothy 3.15? To make man make us wise unto salvation, useful, profitable for teaching, useful, profitable for correction and reproof, and for correction, for training or instruction unto righteousness, and the end result, that we might be equipped completely for every good work. Read with understanding. It's not important how much we read, it's what we get out of it. We need to think about what we are reading. Read with prayer. Ask God for wisdom in understanding it. All right. Read with a notebook and a pencil at the ready. Jot down in your own words what you're reading, perhaps. Make a note of any words you don't understand. Marking one's Bible can also be helpful. Don't wander all over the Bible. If you start with Mark's Gospel, it's a good place to start. Stick at it. Don't give up and start reading the Psalms. Remember, the books of the Bible are meant to be read as a whole. The Bible is not meant to be used in bits and pieces to prove what we believe. We ought to read with an open mind. Ask, what is God saying, rather than going to it to find out what we want to find or what we're looking for? This may mean us changing as we find new truths. This takes courage. But the only way in which God's work can help us is when we go to it eagerly, seeking what it has to say. Read with persistence. We human beings are excellent at starting things and then never get around to finish them. We need to read with persistence. If you read something and don't understand it, don't give up. Read it again. Look at what it means. Seek tools for Bible study. Ask someone to help you to understand like the Ethiopian eunuch did. Then ultimately, this is the real key, not only do we need to read and understand, we need to apply what we read. It's never good enough just to know what the Bible says. All our learning should lead to our living. We need to apply to our lives what we read. The challenge to read the Bible through the year, reading through the Bible requires a developing a plan of daily reading. It holds events and prophecies of the Old Testament in perspective with the heart of divine re revelation as embodied in Jesus the Christ. Why read the Bible through? It's worth reading. Because all scripture is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. It is God speaking to us. Every book, chapter, and verse has a message worth reading and understanding. Although we may not understand all of what we read. We must seek out the truth of scripture. That we might be equipped for every good work. The Bible reveals God's nature to us in many of its multifaceted forms. We need to gain the panoramic view of God's power, wrath, love, mercy, intelligence, pity and greatness to begin to understand that he is the same I am of Exodus that we hear him say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> Reading the Bible ought not to be a drudgery but an insight into heavenly places. It contains some of the greatest literature of the world. In the 18th century, a gentleman was not a gentleman until he had read the Word of God. It can be exciting, captivating, inspiring, filled with tragedy and humour. When we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through God's Word, our reading crosses over from mere enjoyment 
to life transformation. Set aside a different time each day, no matter how you feel, the beginning of the day is best. Consider it a daily appointment with God and keep the appointment faithfully. Read deliberately without letting the pressure of time cause you to hurry. Drink deeply of God's Word. Let the people, the events and the teachings come alive for your life. Use Bible study aids such as concordance, Bible literaries, atlases, but don't let them take over from your Bible reading. In today's situation with the technology, Google <clears throat> is excellent. If sometimes when you want to think of another, or if you're, as you're reading, you think of another verse, but you can't can't remember what it. You can remember what it says, but you can't remember where it is. If you type in what you think it says into Google, quite often it'll bring up the verse you're looking for and the verse you can go to. Read for overall understanding. Read the Bible over and over until it becomes familiar to you. Not in every detail, but in overall scope. Get the big picture. Pick a book. Read it several times until its stories become alive. Its overall purpose becomes clear. Its message cheers your heart. Read from different versions. Give a notebook so that you can record your thoughts or comments or questions. Perhaps try to write the passage in a paraphrase style, in your own words. Read prayerfully with a desire to know God more. A desire, a desire to know His will better. A desire to understand what you already know deeper. A desire to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. The need. Over a hundred years ago, there was a produced in Paris a book that had a striking history. A French man named Henri Lasveri, Lasveri picked one up in an idle moment and became engrossed in it. He realized suddenly that he was reading the Gospels with great interest simply because he had forgotten it was the Bible, and therefore supposed to be dull. This led him to make a simple translation of the four Gospels, resembling an ordinary French novel. The book sold like hotcakes and reached a 25th edition. Many fail today to find the Bible of interest because they use it as a scrapbook, to pick and choose bits from here and there instead of taking a book and studying it. Always ask and answer clearly. What can this book teach me? Can I find something in it, something to strengthen my faith and trust in God? Can I find in it any example to follow? Can I find in it any command to obey? Can I find in it any promise to claim? Can I find in it any warning to heed? Can I find it in anything to lead me to praise and thank God? Can I find in it any prayer to echo? Can I find in it any thought to share with others? How can the message of this book change my life? Principle one, the occasion. Consider the occasion when the original word originally was spoken or written. Who is speaking or writing and who does he represent? Who is being addressed and who do they represent? How would the original audience have understood the meaning? Principle two, context. Consider the context of the message, the immediate context, the statement just before and just after, the broader context, the occasion, the message of the entire letter or speech, the subject context, all that we know from the Bible about the subject, God's entire revelation and flow of scripture. Consider the language used. How does the author use words or phrases on this and other occasions? How do other New Testament authors use the same words or phrases? What kind of expression is it? Literal? Figurative? Poetic? A proverbial saying? Are there translations or textual issues involved? The Bible is never written to answer specifically every possible eventuality that may arise in life. But there are principles in Scripture that give us divine guidance concerning the issues we face today. Jesus taught that such principles existed. He said, Have you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? 
He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. There's no doubt that those to whom Jesus spoke had read about this event many times, but never grasped the broad principle enshrined in the text. Jesus explains that human need, in this case, David relieving the hunger of himself and his men, in some cases is more important than ceremonial law. Hence Jesus' words, having not read, this was a passage he expected them to understand. The Apostle Paul understood this principle very well. In his letter to Timothy, he said that the elders who both shepherd and teach the congregation are to be paid for the work. <clears throat> Where does Paul go for his proof text? Straight to Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. A text with instruction for the fair treatment of an ox. Do not muzzle the ox, which is why it treads out the grain. Paul understood the principle. That if God is concerned for the fair treatment of a working ox, that he can eat the fruit of his labour and must not be prevented from doing so. Surely it follows that God is also concerned for the financial welfare of those who work in leading his assemblies. Finding an equivalent for today, we need to learn to read the scriptures with an eye open to the broader application of the text. <clears throat> for example, Jesus said, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. How can we take the words of Jesus <clears throat> about giving a cup of cold water in his name? How can we find an acceptable equivalent for today? If you went to Siberia in the winter, the last thing they need is a cup of cold water. What would be an acceptable equivalent? A cup of hot soup? A warm blanket? A pair of gloves? Would they qualify? I think they would. The rigid, narrow approach to scripture embraced by the Pharisees and by some Christians today was the root of so many of their problems with Jesus. They would have taken the words of Jesus, a cup of cold water? and debated as to whether or not the water could be served in a glass. Or must it only be a cup? Just how cold should the water be? Would Luke water be okay? Endless debate and discussion would have revolved, resolved, revolved around the text, while the central point would have been missed entirely. At one time, scholars spent years arguing over how many angels would be able to stand on top of a pinhead. Although we must be very careful, it is legitimate to move outside the actual words of Scripture in embracing a principle that harmonizes with the will of God. For example, we are told, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. To fulfill this instruction, must, must the needs of our enemy be met only by supplying with groceries and beverages? Or could we fulfill the teaching of Scripture by providing him perhaps with the funds to become self-employed? Could we find a training course that would qualify him for gainful employment? Of course we could. If someone objects, says, where well, in the Bible does it say we have the right to finance a training course for someone? We reply by saying it's divinely enshrined in the words, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Surely it's better to feed him by giving him a trade than it is to feed him a fish for a day. The Bible teaches us that meeting man's needs is more important than ceremonial law, and that being merciful to one in need is the right thing to do. But we must always realize that in doing good to our fellow man does not give us the right to ignore the Bible and start making up our own rules and laws for worship and religious practice. <clears throat> the principle is found in Scripture provides us with the authority from God to do what needs to be done in carrying out his will. And because all scriptures God breathes is said to be useful for every good work, let us always approach scripture with prayer, reverence and humility so we can understand how to apply the principles taught therein. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I hope it has been beneficial to you and help you to understand better 
the Word of God and the fact that we can, I believe, in the majority of cases, understand what the Bible teaches. If there is any real problem or conflict, we will find it in our understanding rather than what the Bible says. God bless you.